good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to this afternoon's uh, keynote address. My name is Dr. Debbie Ging. I'm a member of the National Anti-Bullying Centre here in DCU and a lecturer in the School of Communications. I'd like to introduce you uh, first and foremost to the real chair of this session, who is a young person from the uh, Irish youth organisation for OIGA. Her name is Karina Tropman, and she's going to do the uh, chairing duties for us today and introduce our keynote speakers. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining you here today on behalf of all the young people in Froiga, Ireland's leading youth organisation. I get the absolute pleasure of introducing to you Shoko Yungiyama, education expert and author from Japan, and Kevin Komashiro, award-winning author and education advocate. Dr. Yungiyama is a senior lecturer in the School of Social Sciences, University of Adelaide. She has worked extensively in the fields of sociology, of education, and Japanese studies, and is recognized internationally as the author of the Japanese high school, Silence and Resistance, which features a key chapter on bullying. Focusing on youth issues such as bullying in school non-attendance, Dr. Yungiyama's research explores the role of large-scale structural factors from a sociological perspective, as well as attending to the perspectives and experiences from young people themselves. Her other publications in, on bullying include Problems with the Paradigm, The School as a Factor in Understanding Bullying, and Theorizing School Bullying, Insights from Japan. Her most recent work includes the book Animism in Cont Contemporary Japan, Voices from the Anthropocene from Post-Fukushima Japan, Addressing Human Nature and relationships and spirituality as key questions in the age of Anthropocene. Welcome Dr. Yungiyama. Thank you, Karina. It's such an honor to be able to speak to you all at the World Anti-Bullying Forum. I thank the conference organizers for inviting me for this wonderful convention. In my talk today, I will be discussing school bullying with a specific focus on Japan. Why Japan? First, because Japan can be regarded as what we call in Japanese a front-runner country in contemporary challenges. It is a notion that Japan represents in concentrated form problems facing contemporary societies as a whole. As I argue today, the Japanese case presents a significant reference point for thinking about school bullying in general. Second, the sociological perspective on bullying is well developed in Japan and should be widely disseminated. Which means, thirdly, that it can suggest a slightly different focus for bullying research and how we can tackle this complex issue. So what are the challenges? I will show three key statistics as the starting point of my analysis. This graph shows the percentages of students who reported being bullied frequently in PISA 2015. Japan is at its high end. 9%, about one in 10 of the respondents, indicated that they got hit or punched around, pushed around by other students frequently, at least a few times a month. 22%, one in five, indicated that they are frequently victimized in one way or another. Second, this graph shows the total number of suicides under the age of 18 by calendar dates from 1972 
to 2013. The total number is over 18,000, about 440 young lives per year. As you can see, there are two peaks. The biggest is around the 1st of September, the other in early April. The 1st of September, Red Arrow, is the day term two begins after summer holidays, and early April, Blue Arrow, is the time the school year begins. Within only three days at the beginning of term two, 317 young people have taken their own lives. But why is the peak in September and not in April when the school year begins? It is probably because many of these suicides are related to bullying. At the beginning of school year, peer relations are not yet set. By the end of term one, however, peer relations are more or less fixed and students know that they cannot escape from it. When they have to return to school from a summer vacation, they dread coming back to it. Of course, not all suicides are caused or triggered by bullying, but as this graph shows, bullying is most ferocious in September in Japanese schools, suggesting that bullying is one of the major reasons for the suicide peak in September. These three key statistics make clear, one, bullying is a grave issue in Japan with drastic consequences. Two, there is a close link between bullying and the education system, and three, this link needs to be addressed urgently. With this in mind, I now would like to talk about three characteristics of bullying in Japan. The first is that bullying happens most frequently within classrooms. In this particular survey conducted by the city of Ozu, some 60 to 65 percent of the victimized students indicated that they were bullied in their classroom. This is quite different from the West where the majority of bullying occurs in the schoolyard. The second characteristic of bullying in Japan is that about half of bullying occurs within a closed friendship group among friends of the victim as repeatedly confirmed by research so far. The third key characteristic of bullying in Japan is that the bullying roles, who is the bully and who is the victim, are often not fixed and often rotated within friendship groups. This has been a consistent finding in longitudinal studies by the National Institute for Educational Policy Research Dr. Taki, the chief investigator there, emphasizes that in the case of primary and junior high schools, this role change often happens within less than six months, though the roles can become more fixed for longer periods as students get older. This reality of rotated roles observed in Japan questions the view that a bully is someone who has particularly aggressive personality traits or moral issues. The fact that roles are often rotated suggests that students involved, whether as bully or victim, tend to be ordinary, non-problematic students. This kind of bullying cannot be explained by paradigm one of school bullying, as so-called by Schott and Sondergaard, that seeks to explain victimization in terms of the individual personality traits. To explain the rotation of bullying, we must look to structural and institutional factors, that is, school factors, by using paradigm two. In order to reflect the mode of bullying widely observed in Japan, I developed this conceptual model that distinguishes between type one and type two bullying. Oops. Type one is the style of bullying 
carried out by program student or students who bully others who are outside their friendship loop. Their perpetrator is fixed, and the cause of the bullying may be unrelated to school. Solutions need to be sought within the individual. Type two bullying, on the other hand, mainly involves good students who show few signs of problematic behavior. They tend to engage in collective bullying, and there is considerable swapping of roles. Type two bullying occurs within a close um, circle of friends. The prevalence of this type of bullying suggests that there are structural factors at work, and thus its solution should be sought within institutional aspects of the school. Type one fits with paradigm one of bullying research and type two, paradigm two. What are the key structural factors then in Japan? The first is the way students are organized in schools in Japan, the homeroom. In this formal system, all students belong to a particular homeroom for the year, a fixed room and group. Teachers come to homeroom to teach. Students spend almost the whole day in this fixed physical and social space in a closed group being unable to escape. Furthermore, each homeroom consists of a microcosm of closed friendship groups. Leaving a friendship group is dangerous as you will then be exposed to a greater risk of being bullied by the whole class. The second school factor is that the group is used as a vehicle to enforce conformity, both at the formal level and informal level. Third, school rules can function as the mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. One striking example of this is the rule that students must not perm or dye their hair. This rule became widely known recently when a student in Osaka sued the local government for forcing repeatedly to dye her naturally brown hair black in order to continue attending school. Apparently, it is an experience widely shared by those with naturally brown hair. This means that purpose of the rule is not so much to prevent students from dying hair, but to enforce super conformity to the norm that students' hair must be black. Today, some 60% of public high schools in Tokyo demand a natural hair color certificate from students at admission. In enforcing such strict rules, the teachers are modeling exclusion, which can impact the school environment in negative ways. And this in turn feeds into bullying by students who mirror or copy teachers. School rules and what teachers say to tell students off are often appropriated by students as the mechanism of inclusion and exclusion, that is bullying. One related example reported recently is this. A bully suicide of a 17-year-old student was judged by a third-party investigation panel to have been caused by bullying by teachers, which was then followed by students. This is significant judgment in that the word bullying was applied to teachers for the first time in the official discourse in Japan. The bullying prevention law in Japan limits the use of bullying to students only. Teachers' conduct resembling bullying is instead referred to as excessive guidance, which sometimes can lead to shidoshi, which means guidance, death. And guidance for some teachers can include corporal punishment or violence in the name of guidance. The Board of Education in Nagasaki recently admitted that corporal punishment, kicking and hitting by a teacher, and bullying by students were factors behind the attempted suicide of a 14-year-old student. 
the positive relationship between authoritarian and violent disciplinary, disciplinary climate and student bullying has been pointed out in various studies in Japan. The fifth factor is the structure of silence on the part of education authorities, teachers, principals, and boards of education. Ever since bullying was recognized as a social issue in Japan in the mid-1980s, we have seen numerous scenes of authorities lining up to apologize to the public in front of the news media. They were apologizing for neglecting or inappropriately denying de dealing with uh, bullying or denying the school's responsibility or deliberately suppressing crucial information. But why has there been little improvement in breaking down this wall of silence? One reason is that those in the system can be blinded by what has become a taken for granted reality. It has been pointed out by some caring teachers, for instance, that their authoritarian colleagues are less perceptive about bullying. Another reason is that teachers are simply too busy to deal with bullying. Japanese teachers have high and increasing rate of nervous breakdowns. Death by overwork, or karoshi, is not unknown among Japanese teachers. This suggests that incapacity to deal with bullying can be more than just the failings of individual teachers. It points to a structural issue within the education system. For instance, there is a problem with key performance indicators of teachers and school authorities. They are rewarded for not having problematic incidents in their homeroom, school, or district. This means that there are structural incentives not to notice bullying and not to report incidents. For more details on my account of bullying in Japan, please see my work. My book was published some 20 years ago, but in many respects, like the increasing strictness of school rules, Japanese high schools have become less democratic and the analysis I presented there have become more relevant today. To summarize so far, I see bullying in Japan like the river in this diagram. What happens upstream influences what happens downstream. Japan is a society where the influence of the school on an individual, the family, the community is very strong. It is called school society. Students are socialized to learn power-dominant hierarchical relationships and to use exclusion to enhance group conformity. Bullying can be an over-adjustment to this aspect of socialization. So how relevant is the case of Japan? To what extent might this model be applicable to the particular social-cultural context you are familiar with is a question each of you could perhaps ask yourself. But I suggest that the Japanese case is relevant in three ways. First, let me zoom out a little and look at students' experience of school from the perspective of different educational systems. This is a result from PISA 2003. The y-axis shows how regularly students attended school. The x-axis shows their sense of belonging to school, which was calculated based on their responses to the five questions shown on the slide. The result shows that East Asia constitutes a distinct group. Students in Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, China attend schools more but their sense of belonging is low. It suggests the possibility that the sociological account of bullying in Japan could be especially relevant in East Asia and other parts of the world, like Vietnam, for instance, where similar education systems exist. So this is my first point. What about relevance beyond East Asia? Here, I'd like to come back to the results of PISA 2015. The recommendations state to combat bullying, 
improve the school climate, especially the disciplinary climate, and in particular, students' perceptions of teachers' unfair behavior. The Japanese case presents a strong reference point for understanding the relationship between, one, a negative disciplinary climate, which may appear to be functioning well from the point of maintaining school order, and two, student perceptions of unfair behavior by teachers, which may lead to bullying. This is my second point. The third is that Japan presents a powerful frame of reference for paradigm two and type two of bullying. In this conference, we have witnessed a strong current towards paradigm two in bullying research and discourse. The rather extreme case of Japan may play an important role in refining our understanding of bullying, school bullying, both theoretically and conceptually. At the beginning of my presentation, I suggested that Japan is a front-runner country for contemporary challenges. I also suggested that it could help us find solutions to, or general directions for, these challenges. The general directions I suggest are that um, we should put a more self-reflective focus, first, on the disciplinary climate, school rules and disciplinary practices, with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in mind as an international benchmark. Second, we should focus more on teachers, their recruitment, education, and work conditions, workload, performance evaluations, to enable them to preserve the rights of the child. And in order to do so, we need to be aware of the politics of school bullying within each country. Third, we can perhaps position our counter-bullying endeavors as a way of promoting democratic education, using more the power of international bodies, UNESCO, friends, this forum. We have a model for this already. United Nations Education for Sustainable Development, or ESD, has worked to promote democratic education as a byproduct of ESD projects. Schools have two contradictory functions. One is to produce, reproduce existing cultural and institutional power structure. The other is to initiate social change to make a better society. Bullying is a contemporary social issue that emerged from our heightened sensitivity against unfairness and injustice. Research on bullying began some 30 years ago in Finland, Japan, UK, because of the loss of young lives to bully suicide. How to change schools and society at large is the homework given to us by children and young people. And we are all here today to do the homework together to create a better society. Thank you. Dr. Kevin Kumashiro is an internationally recognized expert on educational policy, school reform, teacher preparation, educational equity, and social justice. With a wide-ranging list of accomplishments and awards as a scholar, educator, leader, and advocate. He is the former Dean of the School of Education at the University of San Francisco, and is the award-winning author or editor of 10 books including Against Common Sense, Teaching and Learning Towards Social Justice, and Bad Teacher, How Blaming Teachers Distorts the Bigger Picture. His recent awards include the 2016 Social Justice and Education Award from the American Education Research Association, and an honorary doctor in the Humane Letters. Welcome, Dr. Kevin Kamishiro. Thank you. 
All right, well, good afternoon. I won't have a PowerPoint, so unfortunately, you only have me to look at. <laughs> but I'm super excited to be here, and I just wanted to make a, a shout out to the organizers of the forum, and particularly James O'Higgins, um, Lisen um, Burquest, and Jacob Flard for inviting me, and I hope that my contributions this afternoon do justice to that invitation. So we began the forum with, an, with a plenary that brought together the keynote speakers. And in that plenary, Peter Smith asked us to reflect on where we think research should be going. I wanted to spend my time reflecting on this question a little bit more. And one of the themes that have come up for me, this is sort of one of the benefits, I think, of being like the last keynote speaker, is I get to actually reflect on two and a half days of presentations. One of the themes that has come up for me is this kind of um, duality of how we think about the impact of bullying. So many presentations have talked about the impact that bullying has and what bullying is often in the service of. I want to kind of flag two of them that highlight this duality of bullying. Right? One is that bullying pushes down, and one is that bullying pushes up. So pushing down, bullying often functions to police. Right? And I'll spend a little bit more of my comments talking about this. But my first point is really this notion that bullying isn't driven merely by someone being mean or being hateful. And this is what a lot of you have been talking about, right? That there's these other drivers behind bullying. And the, the set of drivers that I want to focus on are the cultural norms, the political ideologies that actually come to life through us kind of taking up these norms and uh, policing them through violence. In other words, bullying is often one of the ways that we service these norms. Yeah? So I want to talk a little bit about that, and on the flip side, talk about how bullying also pushes us up. That also, as many of the presenters here at this forum have talked about, bullying can be a protective act. Right? We find social benefits, we find psychological benefits, but collectively, we also find cultural, institutional, and ideological and political benefits when we engage in bullying. So I kind of want to talk about this kind of other end of the spectrum as well. Before I do that, one of the points that I want to make is that this duality of bullying as both a policing act and a protective act reveals the fragility, the fragility and the contingency of our identities and our communities and our statuses. Right? Our identity, identities of us, I mean of me versus you, our communities of us versus them, and our statuses of in versus out. In other words, one of the things that bullying does is it reveals that these, um, these other sets of dualities are not pre-discursive, they're not a priori, they're not sort of already, or always existing. These are actually socially discursively produced, and we violently sort of regulate ourselves in order to maintain these categorizations and these identities. <clears throat> so in that sense, our identities are regulatory ideals. And they're regulatory ideals, they are unattainable ideals that control us, whether we're talking about the privileged identities or the marginalized ones. <clears throat> they are unattainable, and they are ever constitutive. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. But I want to kind of highlight that they're also increasingly violent the, the more that uh, is at stake. Yeah? So as, for example, a large kind of legacy of injustice, like white supremacy, as white supremacy gets surfaced and attacked, it's not surprising that those who benefit from white supremacy will lash out with even more violence. And then those who are targeted by that violence might lash also in a protective way against that, right? So guarding and protecting a lot of these injustices is not disconnected from not only our sense of self, but how we relate to one another, yeah? So this overall argument that I'm trying to make, that bullying is often in the service of these much larger dynamics, is what I want to try to flesh out then. So let me give two examples of what I mean by that. One is how we uphold certain categories, and then one is how we define them. So let's take sort of the notion of good, goodness. 
And this can be broadly understood. It can be thought about as being popular. It can be thought of as successful, as smart, as attractive, as, I don't know, as the insider, as belonging, right? All of these kind of general categories of good. I think what a lot of scholars have argued is that we uphold these, um, this, category, this understanding of good by kind of disciplining the bad. So the research on hegemonic masculinity, I think, gives us a really good example of this, yeah? That I come from the US context, but actually there are scholars in a number of different national and cultural contexts that have made similar kinds of arguments, that there's multiple forms of masculinity at play, but there's often one or maybe a small set of hegemonic or dominant forms of masculinity. Now, what's interesting about these definitions of masculinity, as some of you who study masculinity will know, is that almost pretty much no one fits those categories, that these are kind of unattainable ideals. And more so, no one is ever these categories. You don't like suddenly get to a place where like, oh, now I'm masculine and I'm masculine forever. Right? No, that's actually not how it works. These are ideals that we must constantly prove, we must constantly enact or bring to life. And the interesting or complicated thing about the research on masculinity tells us that, the, that ironically, we don't actually engage so much in masculine behavior as we uh, disprove the negative. That masculinity is often achieved by showing or proving that you are not the antithesis of masculinity. In other words, it's the attacks on femininity, it's the attacks on queerness, it's the attacks on coloredness, it's the attacks on all these things that go against hegemonic masculinity that makes us sort of um, rise up in that status. Right? And so that's why many scholars have argued that central to masculinity is violence. Right? The way that you uphold that ideal is you police the behaviors and the bodies all around that ideal. Yeah? This should get, um, this should make, this should surface for us this other kind of related idea that the very definition of goodness is actually a political social construct. That it actually serves a political or ideological purpose, right? And more importantly, that these are not pre discursive or pre existing ideas, that they only develop in relation to others. So many of you study social identity, many of you study philosophy of language, so this should sound familiar, that things often have meaning because we create some kind of an other. Right? So the wonderful work of Edward Said, who talks about Orientalism, is a great example of this. Right? How do we construct the identity of the West or the center or Europe? Well, it's because we only do that by creating this whole other opposite called the Orient or the East that captures all that we are supposed to be better than or not. But in schools, this notion that we create something, that we uphold something, only by defining and creating a whole bunch of opposites is also at play. I think many of us like to argue that it isn't the case that naturally occurring, there are some good students and some bad students. What's actually more the case is that we narrowly define what it means to be a good student, and then we make all of the other students into bad students. What's a really concrete example? We say being a good student means you need to be able to sit still for 45 minutes and listen to me lecture. <laughs> but the reality is most of us actually can't do that. And so as you begin to play out, we then put all kinds of labels on you, like maybe your attention deficit, or maybe you're disruptive, or maybe you're just trying to be a troublemaker, or maybe we need to kick you out of the classroom, we need to discipline you, we need to medicate you. Does everyone see? that trying to uphold this very narrow definition of the good requires that we proliferate the many ways of being bad. Right? These are not pre-existing categories. They actually serve a particular purpose. And we could argue that that purpose is to discipline. So ironically, if we think about the cate categorization and identity construction in this way, then it should also point to one of the problems of how we think about the solution to bullying. Yeah. So as a side note, when I think about future directions of research, I like to remind myself that a central function or purpose of education, a central goal of education, should not be to merely repeat what others have already said. It should actually be to rattle the common sense of our times and to see if there's different ways of thinking. And I would argue the same thing with research. 
Research shouldn't merely be about affirming what others have already said or what I already believe. Research should actually be about naming conventional wisdom and seeing what that's preventing us from seeing, asking what that's preventing us from seeing. Right? So I'm trying to tackle some of the conventional wisdom around bullying, not so much maybe from those of us in this room, but if you think about how we hear people think and talk about bullying, we often blame the bully as the originator of the problem, and we focus on the act as that which we are trying to tackle or stop. And one of the solutions then is to try to make the bully into a better citizen or a better student or a better community member. And I'm not saying that we should celebrate bullying. I am saying that that transition of making the bully into the good student should actually raise red flags when I just got through saying that our very narrow definitions of the good student might actually itself be the problem. Stopping bullying behaviors and even repairing relations is about fixing the bully and the, and the kind of relationship, which in some ways is demanding assimilation to yet another regulatory ideal. Right? This may stop bullying temporarily, but it's fundamentally a repressive act, not a liberatory, democratic, or pedagogical one. So let me think then out loud a little bit about, so what are we trying to argue for? This deconstruction, this kind of what the, my wonderful colleagues and friends in Sweden would call the norm-critical approach to education, should be applying, I think many of us would argue, not only to kind of traditional curriculum content, but also to social norms and institutional ideals. Let me reference one of my favorite books that I came across recently. It's called The Queer Art of Failure. The Queer Art of Failure by Judith Halberstam. Halberstam is trying to respond to conventional wisdom. Yeah, like I said, res good research tries to do. And she says, what does conventional wisdom tell us? He now, Jack Halberstam, is how Halberstam identifies. And Halberstam says, how do we normally talk about failure? Well, we normally say failure is good because eventually it helps us succeed. You know, like you fail enough, and then you kind of learn from your failure, and then you kind of build up more confidence, and eventually that's going to help you succeed. Failure is good because eventually it helps us succeed. Halberstam is trying to speak back against that conventional wisdom. Halberstam is trying to say, well, maybe failing isn't good because it helps us to succeed. Maybe failure is productive because it's a standpoint from which to critique success. Right? It's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like queer activism that was sort of uh, in the U.S., queer activism from the 1980s. It was a response to gay activism, right? Gay activism in the United States from the 50s was about saying, hey, we, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, LGBT people are as normal as everyone else. That was the rhetoric from activists in the 50s. But in the 80s, they kind of... Activists initiated, to me, one of the most significant paradigm shifts that we've seen in activism, I would argue, in global social movements. And it was to challenge, not the idea that we're expanding normalcy and say we're as normal as everyone else. It was actually to say maybe our line should be that there's something wrong with how you're defining normalcy. Right? That normalcy becomes the most powerful regulator, and it demands that we police ourselves. Right? It demands that we police those boundaries, and one of the signs that it's succeeded is we've internalized those norms so much that we begin to police ourselves. This is what I'm saying is a sign of bullying. It is a sign that the norms and the goodness and the standards have become so internalized that we begin to regulate ourselves. Right? And if all you do is suppress the regulation, you're actually simply deferring the problem to pop up in other ways. What we actually need to do is look at what bullying is policing. <clears throat> bullying is policing these much larger norms, these much larger ideologies, and that's what we need to be tackling. So as my final point, the solution can't merely be to treat one another respectfully and to become good students or good citizens. The solution must involve everyone, and that even includes the bullies, in working from sites of failure to interrogate via norm-critical education, at least three things. We need to be interrogating the regulatory ideals, these norms. We need to be interrogating the many ways that these norms both demand and police institutionally and culturally, including by schools. I like to make the argument that schools are not merely sites where bully ha bullying happens. 
Schools are actually sites that enact enormous amounts of violence. Bullying is a microcosm of that violence, right? In fact, I like to say I'm not the only one who says, you know, things like the achievement gap in the US, we talk a lot about the achievement gap, right? Like some students are doing really well and some are failing. And many people say that that's a sign that schools are failing as institutions. But I like scholars who actually argue, no, well, actually, that presumes that schools were set up to level the playing field. But mass schooling in countries around the world, historically, many of you study comparative international education, when mass schooling is developed, is it to social, and is it to kind of prepare everyone to succeed? No, we develop mass schooling for the masses, which means we're actually creating mass schooling to socialize and sort. The achievement gap isn't a sign that mass public schooling has failed. It's actually a sign that it's succeeded. It's doing exactly what it's set up to do. And you could argue that bullying is the same thing. It's, 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 schools are so effectively teaching us norms that we police ourselves. So finally, my last point, what, what must we interrogate? Regulatory ideals, how these are policed, and then finally, we must interrogate more liberatory, just, and humane, and productive, and joyful ways to be. The goal of education more broadly, but anti-bullying initiatives in particular, should not be to get us to fit into the world as it is. It should actually be to prepare us to imagine and create the world that is not yet. And that is antithetical to assimilationist demands. That is a revolutionary demand. That is about troubling the very center, including our very definitions of goodness, normalcy, and success. I hope that these questions help us to move in that direction, and I look forward to seeing the changes that we make possible as we do. Thanks very much, everyone. I will now hand you back to Debbie, who will introduce this fascinating topic. Thank you for your attention. Great job. <laughs> thank you, Karina, and thank you very much to our uh, wonderful keynote speakers, uh, Dr. Yonayama and uh, Dr. Kumashiro, for their very uh, enlightening and insightful keynote presentations. I'm afraid as we uh, started late, we're very much over time, so we don't uh, actually have time for questions, but I'm sure we can continue uh, these very interesting conversations in less formal settings um, outside of the, uh, of the conference uh, room today. And finally, I'd also like to thank uh, Karina for her wonderful job as uh, chair. She pretty much did my job for me today. Um, so we're very grateful to uh, Karina for that as well. Thank you very much.